life can bring us storms. Those moments where we wander, wonder, doubt. The journey doesn't stop, but the progress does. It can be lonely, painful. Sometimes we try to stare it down, as if we could somehow will it to go away. Or we think we can go toe to toe and come out the other side, unscathed. We often forget just how small we are. The truth is, storms are inevitable. But when they appear, we have a protector. A savior who knows a thing or two about calming storms. A God who is a stronghold in times of trouble. In our weakness, He is strong. In our fear, He is courage. In our desperation, He is peace. Yes, storms are inevitable. But our God is invincible. Good morning and welcome to True Light Church. We're so happy to have you joining us and we really do welcome each and every one of you. If this is your first time joining us, my name is Claire Benson and I am Pastor Keith Benson's wife. I do exist and I'm real. <laughs> I'm either usually behind the scenes praying or behind the camera or making bread. But anyway, we would just like to open up in a word of prayer. So if you have a minute, just close your eyes. Thank you, dear Lord, for this beautiful day. Lord, we're just so grateful that we could hear your voice, Lord God, through this tough and rough time, Lord God. I pray that you would open up people's hearts and minds so that they would feel your comfort and your Holy Spirit just to begin to move and draw them closer to you, Lord God. We pray over each and every heart anyone that's feeling lonely or anxious, Lord God, even if they're home by themselves right now, Lord, would you just fill that room with your presence and make them just realize how much you love each and every one. I pray for this service as well and this worship. May it just lift you up and be glorifying to you. In Jesus' name, amen. worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has the great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love will 
break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things.
Everybody. It's Pastor Keith, and I'm excited to share with you this morning. Uh, we started a few weeks ago on Easter Sunday, actually, talking about this idea of essential, that what if Easter was essential, and then we looked at last week um, a couple of things that, that God has a list of essential things that, that Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount, and we talked specifically about prayer, that that's an essential thing. And that when we learn to pray the way that, that Jesus outlines for us, it, it ultimately works into our life to eliminate worry. When we can pray, we don't have to worry. And so we started with a few words. The first word is that word essential. And essential means absolutely necessary or indispensable. Also, the word indispensable means incapable of being disregarded or neglected. Crucial, necessary, needed, and required are some other synonyms for essential and indispensable. And so I really want to continue to unpack that idea of what, what is really essential when it comes to our life, when it comes to us deciding to follow after Jesus. What does that really look like? So this next part of this series, it, we're going to jump from Matthew 6, where we were last week. We're going to fast forward a little bit to Matthew 7. And here are Jesus' words. Look with me. Grab your Bible. Hopefully you already have your Bible, but I'll give you that extra second to go grab your Bible to open up a Bible app and read along. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 24. Here's what it says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. 
Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons? And in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Look at this last verse, verse 24. Therefore, every, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Look at that first word in verse 24. It says, therefore. And, and, and what he's talking about in the above verses, relationship and intent are crucial when we're following after Jesus. That it's not enough to just mindless, mindlessly say things, even if they're right. And, and that, that's what he wants from us so much. They, must, they, they don't need to be mindless words. They need to be backed up by our life and our action. I don't know if you've ever tried to talk to somebody and they're doing something else and they just kind of like, uh-huh, yep, okay, no problem. And then you kind of like, you know they're not listening, so you say something outlandish, and then they say, yep, uh-huh, and you're like, okay, you're not really listening. And they might be responding, even with the appropriate answer, but they're not paying attention. And so that's kind of the idea, but in an even bigger scale of our life, it isn't just about saying the right Bible answer, the right Christianese to, to make sure it sounds right. It needs to be proof in our life, evidence backed up by how we live, how we respond. And sometimes we fall short that our words don't match our actions. And sometimes that happens all the time. Uh, in the sports world, sometimes we see people say one thing and then they do another. And, and sometimes they, this is called the bandwagon hopper, where they jump on the bandwagon of whoever's winning. And suddenly, oh yeah, uh, they're the greatest team. Uh, this has happened for years with the New England Patriots. And I'm really curious, uh, if we have an NFL season, that if the New England Patriots and the Tom Brady fans will suddenly now become Tampa Bay Buccaneer fans. I'm really curious. I know somebody that recently posted, and I've known them since they were a teenager, and they were a Tampa Bay Buccaneer fan for years. Uh, when I was down in college, I was in the, the Tampa, near the Tampa Bay area when they won the Super Bowl. And I'm curious now to see who's going to creep over and be like, oh yeah, say all the right things now and look like they're part of this winning, potentially winning team. We'll see. But the, that's the whole idea of Jesus is rooting this out. People will say, notice this verse says, they didn't, they didn't, there's no proof that these people actually did any of these things. They just will say, Oh, I did this. I did this. Oh, I did this. And it was good. And I did it in church. But Jesus says, I don't know who you are. Relationship, intent, the heart of why you did it is so crucial and matters. So let's, as we look at this, what Jesus is going to continue to talk about, let's think about this big picture that what is essential to God needs to become essential to us. That's so, so important. And then we need to actually do what that essential list says. Uh, we cannot pick and choose when it comes to God's word. We can't look at certain things and say, well, I don't like that. It's not easy versus the hard stuff. Well, I'll do the easy stuff and I won't do the hard stuff. No, we have to do it all. And we have to learn how to apply all of it. It's so crucial. It's so important. Application is critical when we're following Jesus. How do I live this out? How do I do this? How does this actually play out in 2020? I almost had to think about that for a minute, what year it actually is, let alone the month or the day. Don't quiz me with that. Jesus uses parables often to help his listeners think about and, and really critically think and then also apply. Sometimes it's helpful with application to not just be a hearer, but to actually do what it says. James warns us, so flip over to the book of James real quick. James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. I'm going to read it. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. It's interesting that, that, that 
it, it says it's actually self-deceiving if we try to do good and think we can earn heaven because of that. Wednesday night, we had a great discussion about this as we're going through Psalm 23. Pastor Joe's been leading our discussion time, and it's been really great. He's been doing a great job. And he, we, he unpacked that thought of, that like, we can't earn this. This isn't about us. That the, that the Lord leads us through these paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Not for us. Not for us to, to feel good about ourselves. It's for his name to be lifted up and people to say, wow, Jesus changed that person. He must be someone I need to really think about. Jesus must have really done something in their life. Obedience then needs to flow out of our, our heart, out of love, out of grace, out of change. And, and I wanted this really clear. When we do good, and, and again, we're getting challenged here, not just to be a hearer of God's word, but to actually do it. So there are works that works don't save us. We're not repaying. We're not repaying the debt. Oh, well, Jesus did a whole bunch of stuff for me. He forgave my sins, so now i got to repay it. No, the payment that was paid for me changes me. Think about that. What Jesus did on the cross, what, what he accomplished, he washed my sins away. That is an overwhelming debt that I could never pay. And because that payment has been paid, it changes me. It's kind of like somebody truly paying it forward. Someone actually going out of their way, pay somebody's mortgage off and be like, whoa, that is amazing. You, you paid my school debt? Hopefully that person would just say, not just say, oh, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. That debt being paid would change that person, who they are. And so has that debt of yours that was paid by Jesus, has it changed you? That's what it should do. That that change creates obedience. I want, I want to do this because of what's been done for me. Back to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to read verses 27, uh, 25 through 27. And he gives this parable. And many of you know it well, but here we go again. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Now, the point of this parable isn't just that one person had a really good real estate broker and the other person did it and they got a bad parcel of land. No, no, no. They're both on the beach. I want us to realize that. They both had the opportunity to build on the sand. But one of the builders chose to put in extra effort, extra work 
to dig down deep. There's a difference. Do you understand? Do you see that difference? And that person who dig who digs down deep gets to eventually some sort of solid substance, some rock down there. And see, that's the picture. We always thought like, oh, that person was foolish. They built, they built on sand. They should have built on rock. No, no, it's even a deeper meaning than that, that, that we can dig down deep, get through the, the sand and get to the rock. Now that takes work. This week, if you drove by my house, my neighbors can attest if they saw me out there, I was doing mulch, compost. Many of you, we, if, we've, if you drive around, you see some people have already done it. And so we were like, we need to do this. And so I was digging a lot this week. Oh man, I was digging and digging. And just in the pile of mulch, you sometimes, you don't want to run out, but you eventually have to get down to the bottom. And it can take a while, wheelbarrow after wheelbarrow, plus my wheelbarrow uh, tire started to deflate, which doesn't help, but that's not anything to do with this parable. <laughs> but the idea is it, it took effort. It took every, uh, keep going back and going back and digging down to get to that foundation. And that's what Jesus wants us to realize, that when we choose to follow after him, we're, we're wise when we decide that we want more of him. We want to be obedient. We want to do it out of love. And so he calls us to dig down deep, to get to that foundation. He's already done the the major work. And now in that life of obedience, I can begin to be wise and build that house upon that rock. He is the rock, yes. But sometimes it's not just a quick fix. Oh, that's what we want, right? We want quick fixes. That's That's a person who built in the sand. Quick, build it. It looks good. That's good enough. No, I want my faith to grow deep. I want my foundation of my faith and my beliefs to be strong upon the Lord. And you know what? Then when the storms of life come, I'm going to stand. My beliefs in the are not in myself. They're in the Lord and his word and his faithfulness. I love this quote about wisdom and about this parable. It says this, what wisdom consists of is clear. A wise person represents those who put Jesus' words into practice. They too are building to withstand anything. Those who pretend to have faith, who have a merely intellectual commitment, or who enjoy Jesus in small doses are foolish builders. When storms of life come, their structure fools no one. Above all, not God. And I don't want to be that type of builder. When the storms of life come, what's happening right now? This storm that's happening in our world has revealed our foundations. Let's be honest. If if our foundation was wealth, well, that might be in question. If our foundation is health, well, well, now we have to be extra cautious. It might be challenged. If our foundation is in family, well, we have a a whole new meaning, and it's being tested on every level, right? Of, Of being in close quarters and being with our family, We want family time? Oh man, we've had overabundance of family time. Our routine, our job, our freedoms, is that where our foundation is? If it is so, we're going to find out through this storm that that foundation will not last. So what's your foundation built upon? You can't just say it. There needs to be proof in our life. Oh, 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 oh. You know, I love this statement that I've heard recently where where people say, you know, well, I, you know, I'm spiritual. That just means no commitment, no rules, no authority uh, often. It's just, oh, I'm just spiritual. Uh, someone might say, I'm lucky. You know what luck is? Luck is the religion of the lazy. <laughs> I don't have to do anything. It's just whatever happens. I believe in God. Well, then, then I, I need to trust him. If you say, I have a real belief in God. Belief is not just something you say. You don't just say, oh, I believe in God. They're, they're, what that word belief means, means trust. And when you trust God, You are banking on him to come through, to follow up, to be there in the midst of everything going on. The word believe, just from the dictionary, means to have confidence in the truth, the existence, or the reliability of something. And we're not just talking about something, we're talking about someone. Do you really believe in it? Is that where your foundation is? That's like a foundational belief that's so important. Look what it says at the end of this parable, Matthew chapter 7, verse 28 through 29. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he had taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers 
of the law. Jesus is teaching with an authority, not authoritative, not in an angry, uh, angry way, but an authority. The idea of authority means this in the Bible. It has, his words had power. They had weight. They had influence, especially when it came to moral authority. He was speaking as if someone was actually uh, not just talking about God, but talking as God himself. Look at what he says. Jesus speaks in the first person, not referring to God as some abstract thought. He says uh, that in that verse is there, that he will banish those from his presence that say, Lord, I did all these things for you. They say it. He banishes them. They're shocked by this. So think about the context of this. Who is this person saying they will banish them from their presence? It's Jesus saying, I never knew you. And see, that's the critical part. That's that relational part. That's the intent behind our our words. Are they there to cover up? Well, that's not the wise way to live. Jesus is saying, take time. Dig down deep. Allow yourself that time to build upon me. Let me be the foundation. It's going to take work. It's going to take effort. I want you to realize that all of these things that we go through, we have to ask ourselves this question. Is Jesus the power and the influence and the weight in our life? Is he holding that number one spot? This will reveal our foundation if we answer that question honestly. Jesus hasn't banished us from his presence yet. That's a good thing. That verse is for the end of time when, 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 we're, when we're face-to-face with the Lord, whether it's in the second coming or we die first. He hasn't banished us. He's letting us have this opportunity as people to draw near to him. Use this time. I know it's hard. It's hard to get into any sort of rhythm and, and some sort of new normalcy, but take the time. It's so important. He's done the most difficult work already. He's taken your shame. He's taken our sin. He's taken every evil and wrong and nailed it to a cross. He bore the weight of all of that. He's offered forgiveness, grace, and new life. Have you accepted it? That's the decision that he doesn't make for you. He wants you to choose it. Now, there's a work that that we get to do now. We get to be obedient. We get to follow after him. We get to choose to live for him. Following Jesus, I always say this, and it's so true, is difficult. It's probably the most difficult thing you could do in your life, but it's always worth it. Then allow him to, maybe some of you, you need to rebuild. That foundation hasn't been him. He's the most amazing construction worker. He works in our heart and our life. And he he unearths the old foundation and removes it and allows the truth of his word and who he is to allow our lives to be rebuilt upon him. And so I don't want you any under false pretense to think, oh, I don't want to do anything now. No, no, we don't have to do anything to earn our forgiveness, to earn salvation. That's been paid for. But we prove our love for him by how we live, by what we do, by what we choose to do, what we choose not to do. And, and it's not a begrudging thing. Oh, I'm not allowed. I can't do this. We get to. And so let's be warned and encouraged by the warning of this scripture, by the warning of this parable, that we can be wise during this time, that we can build our life continually upon God's word, upon who he is, his faithfulness, what he has done, and what he's going to do. I would love to pray with you right now. And again, let me just encourage you, if you haven't been connected to a local church, and maybe you're watching this and you're on the North Fork, we would love for you to connect with us. We are still having church. It's online, but we are still meeting. We are having a Wednesday night Bible study. We are meeting here. We are still available, and many people in our church are are, are praying for different needs and different things that are going on. So we'd love for you to connect with us. So make sure you stay tuned at the end of this. Watch some of those scrolling announcements. Connect with us. We'd love to connect with you. And then, of course, Lord willing, when we're open again, we'd love for you to come and and join and be a part of the True Light family. 
I just want to pray for you today to be encouraged, to take that time each day and grow in your faith. Let those roots dig down deep into who God is. Jesus, we love you and thank you. Your faithfulness is so real and true. And so God, we pray that you would have your way in each and every heart, every person who's viewing this, that you would accomplish what you want in and through this time. Lord, let us not take it for granted. Let, it not, let us not hurry the process that you might have us in to make us more reliant and dependent upon you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great Sunday. I know your story. I've read it cover to cover. And I know the storms that will come. The waves will swell and the sky will darken. Though you'll fight against the current, you'll be swept away. You'll feel helpless and abandoned. And you'll wonder where I am in the midst of it all. I know this isn't the way you thought our relationship would work, but my plans are not for my comfort or yours. My purposes are always and only an expression of love. The scars in my hands are proof that love will sometimes lead you directly into the storm. Though you can't understand my plans, you can trust in one thing, that I am entirely good you can't even imagine how good I am, and my plan for you is no different. When you shout asking where I am, know that I am right behind you, with my arms wrapped tightly around you, whispering, I will never let go. For you are the pinnacle of my creation and the center of my affection. There will come a day when I will quiet every storm, and wipe away every tear. In that day, there will be no more pain or death. But until that day comes, I will be your anchor in this storm. into the toy. Oh. <laughs>